special edition of our Tuesday Times Roundtable today. Um, we are here every single week, and I encourage you to grab one of our schedules uh, and join us for lunch every week. Uh, before we introduce our moderator today, I want to point out that we have uh, some visitors with us uh, that are participating in a U.S. State Department Leadership Exchange coordinated by the Department of State and the Miami Council of International Visitors. Uh, so we have uh, folks, leaders of government and industry from some various countries. So I just wanted to quickly give those people um, that they'd like a chance to introduce briefly themselves and what country they are representing. And then we'll go ahead and introduce our moderator and move forward with our roundtables. Anyone uh, from the group? Why don't you start right down there? We're going to start on this okay. corner. Thank you very much for recording us and for having us over. Thank you for uh, Yeah, my name is Mohammed Khalid Sayed and I'm from South Africa. Uh, and I work as a political staffer for our ruling party, the African National Congress, the party of the famous Nelson Mandela. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Tafna. I'm from Cambodia. I work for the Ministry of Interior. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for coming. Hi everyone. <coughs> this is Ifani Aneke Bimgaba. I'm from Nigeria. I work for Computer Software Developers Association Nigeria. Thank you. Hi everyone. I'm Yasir Hassan. I am from Sudan. I'm a district governor of uh, Zalinge locality in central Darfur state. We know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and I came from Burma, and actually I'm a political activist, and I, I'm working for the proposition of Burma, and I formed my movement. I stayed in prison for nine years. I released two years ago, and very proud to be here. We can thank you. I'm Eric from Israel. Um, I'm uh, working for the tax authorities. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and furthermore, I was a former prosecutor. You look great. Good afternoon. My name is Josian. I'm from Rwanda, a small country in East Africa. And I work for the National Bank of Rwanda. Thank you. Josian, say it again for these people. Oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Josian. <laughs> And I come from Rwanda. It's a small country in East Africa. And I work for the Central Bank of Rwanda. My name is Aminata. I'm from Sierra Leone. I'm a nutritionist. And I work for the Ministry of Health. Hi, everyone. I'm Atiyah Nabi. And I'm from Pakistan. Basically, I'm an investigation officer. And I work for the Ministry of Finance. Me and Zhuang from China. Uh, uh, I establish an NGO working on citizen participation, local democracy. And by the way, I'm also a researcher of the local academy of social sciences, and also attached to some central institution institutes. My major area is social inequality. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am Crispus Ayena. I come from Uganda. I'm a lawyer by profession but I'm elected member of parliament representing about 65,000 people in Uganda. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Hafiz. I'm from Tanzania in the islands of Zanzibar, and I'm the manager of the radio, uh, private radio station known as Hits FM. Hello, my name is uh, Kalim Marinov uh, from Bulgaria. I'm managing a uh, non-government organization. Uh, we're mainly doing uh, some in economic and fiscal issues. Hi everyone, <coughs> uh, I'm Yushan Mishishi from Tunisia and I'm a member of the Anti-Corruption Commission. Hello, I'm Yusuf Alan from Palestine. I work for the Ministry of Finance. our facilitator for today's discussion, Fred Blevins. He's a professor at FIU who teaches journalism and strategic
strategic communication courses here. He holds a BA and an MA in journalism from Ball State University and a PhD from the University of Missouri School of Journalism. And he's held reporting, editing, senior editing positions at metropolitan newspapers in four states. Um, and on a personal note, he really gets it. He's one of the most engaged professors at the university, and uh, he was one of our founding professors in the Global Learning <coughs> Initiatives, uh, creating and now still teaching a course called How We Know What We Know. So it's my honor to introduce you to Fred Lefkowitz. Good afternoon, and welcome to our uh, international visitors. This is a, a unique opportunity for me and for all of us to interact with uh, those who see the world from a different perspective. Um, how many people read the New York Times this morning? Wow. Okay, we got to get better at that, people. Um, on the front page of the print version of the New York Times, down at the bottom left-hand corner, there's a story today about uh, corporations changing their, changing their view about the expression of employees, the free expression of employees on social media outlets uh, such as Facebook. Uh, that employees who get on Facebook and say bad things about their bosses, very much like students get on rate, your, rate my professor and say bad things about their professors, um, that used to be a firing offense at some corporations. At, if you talked about company business in, in places where company business was inappropriately discussed, then you could be dismissed from your job. But today's story tells us that many corporations are deciding that's probably not a very good position to take. And I would contend that they're exactly right. Because speaking out in the workplace or speaking out within the government or against the government or within a corporation or against a corporation is by the First Amendment protected speech. <coughs> and so I think this story this morning tells us a great deal about where we're going as a society and possibly as a world into the free exchange of information and ideas that are as much as possible unfettered. Um, but in this country, for international visitors and probably for the students, the ability to uh, express yourself about your corporation, your employer, or about your government is embedded in the First Amendment in our free speech rights. And although the First Amendment begins with the words, Congress shall make no law, Congress has made thousands of laws. And our speech is, in fact, restricted in this country in many, many, many ways. Obscenity in broadcasting, uh, your inability to uh, be able to play your stereo after 10 p.m. at night, uh, the fact that you can get a ticket sitting on a, at a red light while you're uh, subwoofers in the trunk shake the, the, the glass on my car. Those are not permissible in this country, and they are, they are constitutional restrictions on our speech. There are many, many more, but that's, uh, but many of these corporations thought that because of that, they could by fiat or by their own policies be able to restrict people's speech. Now, what this allows us to do in this country, which is not really allowed in too many countries, is the ability to try to hold corporations and governments 
to some level of accountability. In other words, if a corporation fears that someone may expose wrongdoing inside the corporation, the corporation is more likely to behave better. The same way with the government. That obviously makes sense, uh, you know, if you grew up in a, in a family in which, uh, you know, there were rights and there were wrongs, you probably get that concept. So accountability in this country, although accountability is a relatively new concept, as far as being embedded in the practices of corporations or being embedded in the practices of government. Prior, really, to the 1960s, it was kind of do whatever you wanted to do. There were restrictions, but not as many, and, and protections, but not as many as we have now. In fact, in November, I believe of last year, President Obama signed legis legislation which expanded uh, protections for government whistleblowers, uh, allowing them uh, to, uh, more avenues to uh, appeal, uh, more avenues to expose wrongdoing in government, and also increasing their share of the reward that comes when a, when a corporation or when a government agency, uh, in fact, is found uh, to be in the wrong and there's money that's exchanged uh, because of the wrongdoing. Most people agree, including the Government Accountability Project, which is the leading nonprofit law firm in the United States that pre uh, protects whistleblowers both on the corporate level and the, and the government level, pretty much agree that even with Obama's expansion of the whistleblower protections, not much is going to happen if the government doesn't decide to enforce it. And I noticed that conspicuously absent from the President's inaugural address yesterday, although expanding civil rights and expanding the idea of protection for all citizens, there wasn't a word about the protection of whistleblowers. So it's not a good sign that his new expansion of these, of these laws are going to help uh, with uh, with accountability. So let's suppose that just for our purposes here, uh, what happens if you work for a corporation or you work for uh, the government and you blow the whistle? What happens? What happens when you expose wrongdoing in your corporation? Shut the whole down. What should happen or what actually? What actually happens? Yeah, I mean, let's be real about you're it. You're ostracized. Um, you are relegated to uh, the mailroom in some instances, uh, regardless of your position. And you have become marked as a violator of the corporate culture. It's a very uncomfortable place to live. And if you, in fact, still have a job. Right. <laughs> Anybody else? No. You don't get awards for this. OK. Um, I've had a very extreme example in my country. We are back into multi-party politics. But the, 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 the party in government at the moment is very strict about discipline, intra-party discipline. We had an experience in, um, was it about 1996? when we were now going multi-party, because after a revolution in 1985, there was a one-party system called the movement. Everybody was supposed to be within the ambit of one party. But the constitution, the new constitution provided for multi-partism. So the party in government decreed that all its members would not talk about intra-party politics outside party caucus or appropriate forums. One of the leaders who had been a, liberati a liberation fighter decided actually to bolt out and point out undemocratic practices within the party. And because of that, he was ostracized. He had to run to South Africa. He was about to, uh, I mean, he was um, charged with treason. He was about to 
all sorts of things were supposed to be done to him. And then the international community, of course, uh, got involved. Later on, he was saved because he finally formed another party. And uh, as my brother said, he was ostracized <coughs> from his old party. And that is what happens. These days, we are fighting with the vice of corruption <coughs> in the office of the prime minister, in corporations, and so on and so forth. But if you dare point out the name of a key person in government, somebody with favor with the president or the chairman of the party, you are likely to be reprimanded or even ostracized or punished for that. These are the uh, vagaries of life in my country. What's Uganda? Yeah. But don't you think that's sort of the way of the world? Well, the I mean, I, aren't, aren't, aren't most countries in that same position? It would appear. It would appear because at least I think to a great extent we are enjoying a level of freedom of the press in my country, which is, I think, way are better than many countries surrounding us. But that does not mean that we are, uh, are really enjoying a level of freedom that would be compared to America. Well, this is probably not going to be much consolation, but you know, this country didn't get off to a great start either. <laughs> and I don't know if you're familiar with the, with the radical writer Thomas Paine and the founding of this country, but Thomas Paine actually became a cabinet officer and was the first one dismissed from his position because he broke the government, the founding fathers' ban on speaking to the press. <laughs> he actually leaked stuff to the press and lost his cabinet position. So um, we don't have a clean record in this country, but, but compared with most countries, it's pretty good. I mean, our ability or our freedom to speak out uh, although, as you will see, on February 7th, we have two whistleblowers coming to campus. I invite anybody to come to this uh, event sponsored by the Office of Global Learning Initiatives, the College of Business, the College of Law, and the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Two whistleblowers are going to be here, corporate whistleblowers, who one blew the whistle on some issues at the Deutsche Bank, and one uh, blew the whistle on mortgage fraud at Bank of America Countrywide. And to hear some of their stories about what they went through internally at their corporations is pretty riveting. So I'd invite you to, to come and sort of participate in that event as well. However, getting back to your point, I think that um, how governments, <coughs> specifically in, in, on the government side of whistleblowing, deal with whistleblowers um, is, at least for the purposes of this country, or not, to, how's it done with corporations in Uganda? Uh, in Uganda, uh, to, to, to a great extent, uh, we are just experimenting with, with the, the principle of whistleblowing. In fact, there was a very strange episode that happened in my country just a few, a few months ago. There was massive corruption in the office of the prime minister. It so happened that there were some areas of the country which had been engulfed in a state of rebellion and war. So our development partners agreed to contribute funds for helping those who had just come out of war. These funds were channeled through the office of the prime minister. For some reason, we don't know whether the permanent secretary, who is supposed to be the accounting officer, did not know. But in the end, it was discovered that billions and billions of dollars had already been siphoned out of the account. The issue in Parliament, where I sit, was that the accounting officer should sit aside so that he, together with many other people, would be, uh, you know, um, investigated. The president of the country said, you know, the accounting officer with the permanent secretary was the wish of law. And then our reasoning was, if the accounting officer, who was supposed to be in charge of the funds, became the wish of the wish of law, that means tomorrow I could kill one of my own kids 
And then I shout out and I say, hey, something, but my kid has died. I should be exonerated because I have blown the wish. So the principal is defeatist. And uh, this is, in my country, it depends on who blows the wish against who. If you blow the wish against somebody who has the favor of the powers that be, you are going to get in trouble. This is how it happens. Well, but let me point you to a relatively recent American uh, <laughs> occurrence of the same type of thing uh, with Katrina, with our hurricane disaster relief. There's still no one gone to jail that I know of on that, but money that was supposed to be all of a sudden ends up somewhere else or it ends up missing, uh, whatever. So, I mean, that's, that is, uh, uh, but those are the kind, but okay. So let's, let's uh, so what is the future of all this? If you read uh, the article that I suggested that you read, I wish the social media article had been out I would have suggested that everybody read that one, but this particular article that I've suggested that you read addresses the issue of accountability in government becoming a political um, moneymaker. Um, if the attorneys who make a lot of money on accountability lawsuits against the government uh, find or are, are, are able to get laws to expand the protection of employees in the government, they then expand their client base. Does that make sense? So if I'm an attorney who handles whistleblower cases, I'm going to probably give money to a presidential candidate who I think is most likely to sign legislation like Obama signed. That in turn is an investment on my part contributing money to their campaign for the purposes of making more money down the road. I don't know about you, but that's, that's pretty creepy to me. I mean, the idea of government accountability being exposed to lawyers who can then make more money on the practice. Um, Stephanie. About, um, in terms of other countries and other practices, you mentioned that the legislation offers more avenues for whistleblowers, for, for, for individuals or groups of individuals to um, hold corporations and governments accountable, such as, you know, there's, um, there was Deep Throat who went to reporters, okay, so there's traditional, people go to the press anonymously, or you could use social media. You can appeal to international NGOs. You can appeal to your own boss. You can try to unionize. I'm curious, like, what works and what doesn't work in different countries and in terms of how do you get the word out in a way that is safe, that balances your personal safety, but also effectiveness? Well, I don't know. Good. The answer, but. But, but, yeah, well, yeah. it's kind of a moving target. But, but you bring up a good point, and that, a couple of good points there. Uh, one is, is that the law that Obama, the expansion that Obama signed, doesn't have anything to do with corporate whistleblowing. It has only to do with government whistleblowing. But, but what we find, and, but bringing the press into this, is really an interesting angle because the free expression that goes along with whistleblowing that unites with freedom of the press is a pretty powerful juncture uh, that also doesn't exist very many places. So if social the if, media, social media. for now, yeah. I'm not banking on social media because uh, living very long with full First Amendment protection. The reason is is that uh, social media has become a big big. Uh, room in which people can go in and behave badly. And that does not portend well for protections on people's expression when people cannot behave well or do expression in a responsible way. But let's go to that First Amendment thing that we have here. 
this juncture of speech and the press. If I'm a whistleblower now, and specifically on the government, I have expanded protections when I go to the Securities and Exchange Commission, let's say, to report my to report something that's going on in my agency, or to go to the government accountability office or somewhere, or to the attorney general's office and somewhere to file a complaint. I have, a, I have a, a, now an expanded opportunity to do so. I also have an opportunity to go to a reporter and say, you know, you work for the New York Times, um, let me give you, I want to I want to tell you about a story. I want to tell you a story. And the New York Times reporter says, oh my God, that's amazing. But you can't use me because I will put myself at risk by talking to you. The reporter then has a tremendous amount of protection to protect you as a source. So the avenues that are available to a whistleblower are many. Some uh, will go that route, and, and I think that the interesting part is because the confidentiality of the source to the reporter is an essential part of American journalism. So if a reporter agrees not to give, not to reveal the source, then that's a prima facie responsibility of the reporter to never reveal the source, even if, even if, they are ordered to go to prison by a judge. But does that same, does that same uh, responsibility exist in other places? No. Not, no. I have just an observation to comment. Um, I didn't talk about, uh, we heard a lot about the whistleblower system in America and in that discussion in Washington and other states. I think it's not just a freedom of speech, um, the right. It's become like an obligation rather than a duty for a federal employee. <coughs> if you know something really, if you have some information in this that's something very material and something you would want to discount it or not disclose it, you may be in trouble. Uh, on, going back to the uh, whole thing with the media, uh, I can share my experience in my country. I mean, it's very difficult somebody has come up and speak about misconduct, about how official. Uh, we have, in some cases, reward schemes. But how they work, it's not going to uh, give any positive outcome because uh, you pay uh, the informer, the insider, uh, it's a small chunk of amount at the time you disclose the information, and then it goes along to the proceedings. So it takes like 10 years. So you are there, you are still, uh, a fear, have this fear, or maybe I'll be this. So I mean, my identity will be disclosed. Yeah. So nobody will come forward uh, disclose some information. So you don't have that much incentive here. But then the role play with the media, yes, we have many cases where, because we have free media now, that was not as much free as we have now these days. But I think the media has become very irresponsible. Mm -hmm. There are many cases where they have uh, given information and uh, there was no investigation. They never verified the facts. And there was a whole scam against the Chief Justice Department, which was very untrue. Mm -hmm. So I think media has to be very responsible. We have some ethical standards which are missing in my case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, sometimes it, once you get the freedoms, it takes a while for sometimes for ethical constructs to become part of the conversation. I mean, you know, the press was founded as free in this country in allegedly 1776, but uh, the discussion of ethics and journalism in this country didn't begin until the early 1920s. So for a long period of time, people were sort of driving without a map. And, you know, so the the inculcation of values and morals and all of that into a free press sometimes is a very painful process I think um, and, and the, the gentleman here who, who was say but he um, implied that the international community came in in one of the cases as the whistleblower um, wondering if that's the if that's the case to answer Stephanie's question that in other countries the in the pressure of the international <coughs> community acts as a whistleblower because uh, uh, I mean the frustration
that we have in some countries is that the confluence between whistleblowing and action is lacking. Yeah. Because you don't whistleblow for the sake of whistleblowing. You whistleblow so that there is an action taken. Right. So more often than not, somebody will shout his voice out. So long as the <coughs> implementation machinery is not put in place, so long as the government in place is not willing to act on it, it's very frustrating. It is. It is. It's a t and, and it's that way here, too. I mean, this enforcement thing in the Obama, with the Obama legislation is, is troubling. And I, and I, I don't, uh, but, but Hillary's point is very well taken. I mean, a, a government accountability project is doing more and more work internationally uh, with whistleblowers internationally, whether it's on the government or the corporate level. Um, because the concept of revealing that information and bringing, you know, the power of publicity is pretty, as you know, is it can be devastating and really that's what's at work behind it is a corporation or a government not wanting to be embarrassed by the activities going on within the corp within the agency so uh, a lot of it just has to do with but the interesting the interesting point here about duty and obligation um, how many of you just the students here how many of you feel that faced with the possibility of losing your job or being ostracized or being demoted to the mailroom or whatever would actually speak out against your employer? Yeah, you say that now. <laughs> you say that now. You wait till you get that $60,000 a year paycheck. And, and, and then you start saying, wait a minute, I got this kid to feed. Wait a minute, I got a spouse. Wait a minute, I got a four dogs to feed. Believe me, I know what that costs. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not belittling. I mean, you, pro you might do that, right? You, you, but the fact that you would put your hand up, I think, is pretty remarkable because I'm not sure that a lot of people in the workforce think that it's either an obligation or a duty to speak out against wrongdoing within their organization. I don't think that they do. I mean, I'd like to be persuaded otherwise. Um, the fact is that in Israel, uh, we have a service of the public controller, we call it. He makes reports, and he, he really uh, has the, uh, the uh, prerogative to give uh, protection to a whisper to his blog. But if, if you look at the bottom line, it doesn't work much. Right. It's not good. If you're looking at the assessment, the risk assessment, but it's not worth it. <coughs> so our, this is where our prosecution works really, really, really good in, the, in that point. But I think it, it's good and bad. It's good because well, you get people to, to prison. In Israel, it's a prosecution that's very effective in terms of political people, Currently, it's going with investigations uh, against really important people. Uh, but on the other hand, well, um, it means that it, it's too hard. You, you have only the prosecution. You don't have something between, in between, that would be much more um, maybe educative. Something much more. So, so it's uh, more punishment than it is rehabilitative. Yes. You don't really fix anything that you put somebody in prison. Very good point, because I think the people didn't know the guys, uh, uh, part, of, uh, part of the problem is that the guys who did the wrong thing, the wrongdoing, the bribery, the, the, those who took the bribery, whatever, they didn't know about, they didn't know that they were doing something wrong. <laughs> they thought they were, well, I thought I could. So some, there is something wrong with going education. So I don't know if it's sometimes, I don't know, yeah, you can say maybe it's hypocrite, hypocrite and all that. But, but I think that there is a lack of education maybe in terms of not prosecution, not always prosecution. I'm not sure that prosecution is the only right solution. No, and I, and I, and I uh, fully agree with you because usually one person suffers for it and everyone else gets away, right? I mean, generally, 
the people who are responsible for wrongdoing under a situation where you prosecute somebody is that we're not going to really worry about fixing this issue. We're really going to be interested in punishing this person. And then that person goes off to prison, everything's back to business, everybody's doing everything that, like they used to. Which, when you think about our whistleblower laws, which then, you know, if you blow the whistle, there's a possibility that you may get part of the settlement that goes along with that. I mean, we had a whistleblower here last year, John Oberg, who blew the whistle on, by the way, all the students in here are getting student loan money. You should, you should uh, worship John Oberg. He was the guy in the Department of Education who blew the whistle on a scandal we had here about uh, private student loans being brokered by banks. And he blew the whistle on that and cleaned up the whole student loan uh, situation. He is, in fact, party. I think he's settled eight out of ten lawsuits, or he, he hasn't, but the government has, because they took his case, the government took his case against those uh, bankers. And eight out of ten of those have been settled now, the least of which was for $3.5 million. He's retired. I mean, the guy's 67 years old, and he, and he came here and said, well, I don't need, don't give me any money, travel money, I'll just come on my own. He brought his wife, stayed five days. The guy's enjoying life because he said, this is wrong. And as a result of that, the students, of course, benefited from it. But the fact is, he's benefiting as well. All I'm trying to do is figure out, I'd like to get some of that money from him, but that's, that's a whole other matter. Okay. Um, I want to look at it this way. Um, we should blow it really shouldn't be about the money. And um, I think the people that actually were doing whistleblowing before governments started you know, trying to encourage this, we're not doing it because of the money. Most of them are driven by um, what I would say is emotional reasons. Mm -hmm. A typical example is in Nigeria. There's um, the um, Minister for Health, okay? Uh, no, sorry, not Minister for Health, but um, the head of um, the um, drug organization <coughs> that actually give drugs over in Nigeria. Correct? Okay. okay um, while she was um, Many years ago, before she was actually you know, appointed for that position, she had she lost her sister, you know, because um, her sister was injected with the drug. Okay, and then when she when she took up the position, you know, she, she she was serving the Ministry of Health before she eventually was you know given that position. She you know did some whistleblowing there, and after which you know she was eventually not given that position. And the, the motivation what drove her to you know to do that was because there was. Every time she sees somebody trying to actually deal with them, um, with dealing fake drugs or protecting people that are doing fake drugs, what she sees is the face of her dead sister. Mm -hmm. And then I think that should be the major motivation for this doing. Of course, governments can as well go ahead and help, you know, in some of the other groups that are helping, um, giving incentives to the people that are you know, trying to uh, do this whistleblowing. And that is also good. But I think the major motivation should be you know, the, the fact that you feel something is wrong here and then you, you feel that um, you should be able to actually, you know, come out, say about it and then get it in place. And if this is the case, then people shouldn't necessarily be, you know, it should be, it shouldn't be about the money. And then the major thing that organizations or um, government should do should be to try to make sure that the, 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 the issue that was, you know, brought to the public is addressed. And that is um, where the issue of the, what then, what he said is the prosecution, right. problem. Exactly. Right. So if it's not about putting people in jail, it should, I think it should be more of um, making sure that um, the circumstances that brought about the situation gets fixed. You know, gets fixed. Right. Exactly. No, and I, I, I agree with you, but I also would, I'd contend that at least, you know, I know now, I, I probably, I, I guess 11 whistleblowers I've actually met um, and I don't think there's a single one of them that went in with even any idea that they were going to make any money in the deal. And they were also people who didn't need the money. I mean, like this guy, Oberg, he didn't need the money. He had a nice retirement. He, he had a Ph.D. He was, you know, he was very distinguished in his field. He had, he had been responsible for writing much of education policy in the Department of uh, Education over the years. He was not a guy who was really too concerned about 
the money. But because the government joined in, or the government took his case and did it, he got that money. Now he's in the process. I, I, I think he's going to give it away. I, I, full, I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. But, and I think a lot of whistleblowers do that. I don't think there's very many whistleblowers who get it. I mean, I don't know, none of the ones I know got into it for the purposes of making any money on it, and many of them give it away. So I think you're right, but I think that if that's there, some people who otherwise might not have spoken up might speak up. Um, the Government Account, just a second, the Government Accountability Project in Washington is a law firm that represents these people. I mean, people come in through the door, and they sit down, and they say, what's your case? One out of like 20 cases or 25 cases, they take. The rest of them are just disgruntled employees who did something wrong and are trying to be vindictive against their company or their government agency. And they don't take their cases. So there are filtering systems that happen here. And the, and the Attorney General's office does the same thing in screening the cases. They look at them very, very closely as to whether they're going to take those cases up. So. Yeah, it shouldn't be a money factor, but I don't think money is an issue yet, but it might become one in the future. That's what I fear about this campaign contribution thing. I don't know. We'll see. I'm sorry. Uh, I come from a small developing country in West Africa, and because we don't have um, whistleblowing laws, protection laws right now, what I see we do now is use the international organization because that is so effective and we get loans from the, from the international community and if anything is going on in the government, people get, people use the international community and the, the citizens that are in diaspora to blow the whistle on the government and this is very, very effective because we need the aid and we need to be seen to right. be doing the right thing in terms of government accountability. So that's the channel I see we are using right now because it's, like you say, you blow the whistle, you have kids, in fact, you're not being paid much. And so you're not going to forfeit that because you want to do the right thing. So people use the international community to blow the whistle on what's going on in the country. That's very interesting. What, what country are you in? That's very interesting. And, and, and one that, see, I, I wouldn't look at very, I mean, wouldn't be aware of just by my, the work that I do, I wouldn't be aware of this sort of international, I think you touched on it earlier, this sort of international blanket now that can be used. Is that, that's what you're really talking about, right? Yeah, or avenues like to. Now, right. right. Well, I mean, if you look at the, the stories out of, the, out of China by the New York Times, <laughs> you know, about the, the, the ruling family. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, tell me somebody didn't blow the whistle on the ruling family. That's how that got into the New York Times. Uh, and, and, and now the New York Times has been expelled from China, uh, which I think they'll find out that's probably not a very good move, but, or they've closed down the bureau at least. Dr. Blevins, it's certainly a very interesting discussion here. In the beginning you mentioned that accountability is a new phenomenon, but the bottom line is that now people are demanding the governments to be accountable. It was not there because everybody kind of thought the government would take care of them. But there's a lack of trustworthiness in I can challenge everyone who trusts their own government. So and that's the lack of trustworthiness is everywhere. Everywhere, all over the world if you look around. And now whether you do the whistleblowing, whether you do the social media, whether you do newspaper, media, media also is biased. Either, either it's owned by corporations or it is the government mouthpiece. Everywhere it's like that. So who do you trust? And this is where these are the different mechanisms, whether you do by whistleblowing or social media, people will find a way to bring it out. How long it will take, we don't know. We don't know how long it may be, like maybe 10 years, and then like whosoever it brings, like there's so much of repression, so much of repression is going on. But there has to be a way, there has to be a method by which the person who brings out the accountability issue, whether the government is accountable, whether the corporation is accountable, that's what the issue is. And then different countries like this very nicely bring in the international uh, team or international NGOs who can bring those things into the focus. So those are some of the new things by which the government will have to be accountable sooner or later. I mean, it's interesting to 
to think that that the U.S. Uh, uh, First Amendment, for instance, uh, protects this reporter in China, in this country, but doesn't protect the reporter in China. Uh, but does the fact that the exposure came out in a free press, or a relatively free press that we have in this country, uh, is that enough to sort of hold a, at bay the Chinese government? I mean, they can close down the bureau. I mean, certainly they can do that kind of thing. But to prosecute the reporter or something like that, that hasn't happened. So the power of publicity, I think, internationally is a, is a, is a remarkable tool uh, that, quite frankly, I haven't given a lot of thought to, but I'm going to now. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So I'll talk about um, my country, which is not a state yet, Palestine. We still have kind of autonomy, but we don't have a state. I believe our situation is unique because everyone is protected because each one belongs to a certain party. And the party is very strong in, in Palestine, either Fatah. If you are in uh, West Bank and you belong to Fatah, nobody can touch you because you belong to this strong body, strong movement. So I know I'm very involved with a lot of whistleblowers, groups of uh, young people who, who filed complaints against ministry. But I believe the problem is in the structure of, we have an anti-corruption commission, but the structure of the anti-corruption commission is problematic. Like It's corrupted. Know, what? It's, is it corrupted? Well, some people <laughs> have, some people call it the corruption committee. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if, if you file a complaint against someone that the president wants to push out of the political line, he will go, he will be found guilty. But if he still has a potential to stay, then he will not be found guilty. At least this is the claim that some people say. But I believe everyone is protected to this law. I am personally whistleblower. Whistleblower. I am protected. And nobody touched me. But this is, I believe, a unique situation because we don't have a state. We're still in in the process of having liberation. So anyone who belongs to this movement is protected. You know, it's interesting you bring that up because there's a case, uh, sort of an ongoing case here in this country, a rather celebrated case involving a guy by the name of Thomas Drake. And Thomas Drake was involved in uh, uh, exposing uh, the government's uh, uh, manipulating a contract, which he advised them this is the cheaper way to do it and the better way to do it. He blows the whistle on them. And the case, he files the case, but the Attorney General's office doesn't like it. You know, they, just, they don't like the case because it has to do with national security, right? I mean, so it's one of those where the Attorney General's office says, well, if we get involved in this, we might be viewed as anti-national security, which is a, ridiculous. But the story is that Thomas Drake lost his job, the Government uh, Services Administration, I think, and then he went to work at an Apple store in Washington, D.C. He's, he's selling iPads because he's kind of a geeky guy. So he's in there one day and he turns around and looks at the door because the, the, somebody comes in the door and he turns around and looks and it's Eric Holder, the Attorney General of the United States, who won't take his case, right? And so Holder is overlooking at devices on the wall, you know, in the Apple store, and he's shopping and all that. And, and, and so Drake walks over to Eric Holder, and he says, uh, can I help you with something? And Holder turns around, and he looks at him, and Drake goes, do you know who I am? And Holder goes, I know who you are, turned around and walked out the door was not going to have anything to do with a discussion with Thomas Drake. Now that 
it, I, I, as I told Drake, or I mean, it, that's pretty powerful. When you scare the attorney general out of your Apple store, <laughs> so he was looking at it as a, a downside. I said, well, maybe the upside here is, is that he didn't. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Of course. Why? Why would? Law I mean, lawyers. Yes, lawyers are a huge lobby, and they, you know, in this country, I think probably worldwide. Professor, we we are just talking about the people who are whistleblowers, but the ninety percent of uh, the whistleblowers was being spoken by the media. So, who can protect media? Big role of whistle. Of course, there is a law who can protect. <coughs> when we were in Washington, we met the uh, organization which is dealing with protection of whistleblowers. Okay. Uh, there is nobody who can go out there and say uh, maybe the government is corrupted, but it will uh, be spoken through the media. So who can protect the media? Well, that's a very good question. In, in, it depends on where you are. I mean, if you have an evolving free press, it's going to be tough. If you have no free press, it's going to be almost impossible. And, if you get, and even if you have a free press like we know in this country, it could be pretty rough. I mean, it, so I don't, I, I can't, I, in some in some cases, if you look at this as a three-legged stool, you know that that, that the three <coughs> legs have to be in place for the stool to be upright, and the press is one of those. I don't know I don't know how you put I don't know how you do that. I mean I don't know how you sort of like that intersection of the First Amendment and and, and or the uh, freedom of spree speech and freedom of press in this country just doesn't exist. But the protections are both ways. The reporter gets a certain level of protection, and then the whistleblower gets a certain le level of protection. So I don't know what I don't I don't know how to answer that. I mean, I wish I did. I wish I could say, but you know, it appears that this sort of international influence, and if who you were meeting with was it Gap, was it the Government Accountability Project you were meeting with in Washington? Okay. So Louis Louis Clark, was he was he meeting with you? No, it wasn't Gap. No. It was another. Oh, one of them was from Gap. Okay, but they had a panel of uh, of them. Well, what was their answer? Um, actually, they didn't answer directly, but till this time, I didn't get the really answer because wherever we go, it's only talking about protection of individual, but not protection of the media. So maybe. You can well, we. Well, I, I mean, actually, I can talk about that part of it in this country, but the problem is it's very unique. I mean, we have journalists in this country have a limited privilege to confidentiality with sources. I mean, and and in a trial court, it's almost it's almost a blanket immunity. <coughs> in a grand jury, it's a different deal. But if you if if a, if a reporter is called in this country to reveal their source, they can actually refuse to do so. They may go to jail, and they should go to jail if the judge orders them to do so under contempt of court. But, but I, don't, I don't think that exists anywhere else. I'm not aware of it existing anywhere else. What's that? Make a proportion. Where? Can I make a proportion? Yeah. Uh, professor. The nature of whistleblowing seems would only be relevant if we globalize it. The economies of all countries seem to have global connotations. The way my sister here talked about her experiences in Sierra Leone and what I have experienced in Uganda, 
the scenario I was giving you ended up actually in our development partners actually stopping aid to our country for a long time. So would it be the issue that the best way to go now is to ask those great diplomats who sit in Washington DC at the United Nations or the regional uh, bodies to enact conventions, international conventions about whistleblower conventions that can assist because in America, it might be um, easy for you to implement we shall uh, blow our legislation. Oh, it, that, no, but in it a took 25 world country years. <laughs> like ours, mine, and that of Sierra Leone and other countries where there are so many factors that have got to be taken care of, it may not work. So the globalization <coughs> from the fact that all these economies are pegged to some central point somewhere, and this is a point I've been emphasizing in all my, uh, you know, interactions with the people in the United States. You are the leader of the economies of this country. If there was a way we could sponsor an international convention, we should blow up convention, that might be the way. So that we benchmark, you know, aid. You know anybody's got any money that we could put that on? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so yes. you know, I think oh. we have about time for just one more question. And I know yeah, and one more. Yeah, um, I was just going to comment on what they were saying about involving money when it comes to whistleblowers. I think it really depends because um, if you guys know Jacob, Jacobo Timmerman, he was actually a journalist from Argentina in the 70s. Right. He was a whistleblower because in his newspaper he would write about all the things that both sides of the government were doing. So if someone went missing, he would write about it. And he would do this for years until finally he was arrested and put in jail for no reason at all. And he, was, he actually ended up being exiled. Now for him, it, w it wasn't about the reward. It was just that he, he just thought that, no, this is right. We can't live like this. But in other cases, maybe, maybe in the corporate world, say I have a job with the government and I see, okay, they're embezzling money. <coughs> Am I going to say something? No. Because even though they're embezzling money, whatever, they're rich people. Let them, you know what I'm saying? Let them do their thing. Oh, That's not affecting right. me in terms of right. my general life. I'm not going to be suffering because of it. So I'm not really going to be willing to just blow the whistle like that. But <clears throat> some people might be willing to do that if there is some kind of financial reward. So I think it really does depend. Because people need to know that, okay, if I risk my job and I say something, Am I going to be taken care of for, for even a little while until I can get back on my feet and become stable? But then in Very other cases, point. there doesn't need to be a monetary, there doesn't need to be a monetary reward because you just can't live like that, you know? It right. all goes back to even activists, you know, even Martin Luther King, Marcus Garvey. They just realized that, listen, it can't work like this, so it depends. I would just uh, urge you all to, uh, even our international visitors, if you haven't seen a movie called The Insider. Uh, I would recommend that you watch it for, uh, and the reason is, it's the story of a whistleblower in big tobacco in this country who blew the whistle on big tobacco, a guy by the name of Jeffrey Wygant. And Wygant blew the whistle on, on tobacco companies in this country, and he did it, uh, was started to do it through CBS News which everybody thought, 60 Minutes, CBS News, this is good as gold, blah, 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 blah. CBS got engulfed in a buyout at the very time that the, uh, that the uh, story was going to air. CBS backed off of the story and said they were not going to air it. And then the reporter who was involved in the, uh, blew the whistle on his network. So you had a tobacco where you had a, a scientist at a tobacco company that blows the whistle on the tobacco industry, tries to do it through the media, which gets blocked by corruption in the media, and then the reporter blows the whistle to other media on his own employer. So it's a, it's a string of whistleblowing that goes on, and the things that go on in the interactions and the motives and the, um, the, motives and the values that are involved of course, they're vastly different from one to the other, but to see how it works is pretty remarkable. It's a little bit fictionalized, but not a lot. So I would suggest that you 
if you want to see how something, the media can be involved and corrupted and everything, even in this country, that's a good one to look at. Anything else? So we're going to end the oral portion of our roundtable on, on that note. Uh, so if you have any uh, pressing comments for Dr. Levins or any of the visitors, we're going to, uh, um, once everyone uh, packs up everything, talk for a little bit more in an informal setting. I do want to mention a New York Times event that is coming to FIU next week. Um, Brian Stelter, who is the media reporter for the New York Times, is going to be at BBC on January 31st in the Wolf Center Ballrooms at BBC at 12.30. And the title of his talk is The Future is Social, How Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube are Changing the Way We Talk and Think. Yeah, um, not to be missed. He's um, an amazing... He's like 28 years yes. old, and he got hired by the New York Times because his website, social media website that he set up, news site, ended up getting bought out for a lot of money, and he became a star while he was in college of news on social media, and he's now one of the top media writers at the New York Times at the ripe old age of 28. So this is a guy you want to see. He's, he's amazing. Thank you.